All right, well, good afternoon. I have the privilege of representing brave female athletes across the country in lawsuits to defend fairness and safety for women in sports. They are my inspiration in going to work every day, and they are genuinely having an impact on the legal landscape as it pertains to protecting women's sports. But before we talk about lawsuits, I want to start with just a brief orientation about laws protecting female athletes in order to lay just a bit of a foundation. I'll see here. Of course, where else could we start but Title IX? Title IX is our classic U.S. federal law passed over 50 years ago that prohibits discrimination in education and athletics. I want to offer just two quick orienting points about Title IX. Number one. There is no legal ambiguity about the definition of sex in Title IX. Until about a half second ago, sex was universally understood in law to mean biological sex. The statutory language of Title IX itself, not fully captured here, commonly references one sex and the other sex, clearly evidencing a recognition of a binary. And no Supreme Court decision, including Bostock versus Clayton County, which many of you may be familiar with, changes that analysis, all right? Bostock specifically recognized that transgender status and sex are two, quote, distinct concepts. So Bostock did not change the definition of sex in Title IX. Number two, Title IX clearly provides for separation between the sexes where biological differences matter. Typically, if you think about it, no discrimination on the basis of sex would implicate sex blindness, right? That would mean you could not take sex into account. But Title IX doesn't exactly say that. The text of Title IX specifically allows for sex-separated sleeping quarters, human sexuality classes, even father-son and mother-daughter events. And of course, its implementing regulations specifically allow for sex separation in private spaces, and of course, most importantly for our purposes here, in sports as well, where competition um, or contact is involved. So at the risk of stating the obvious, it is absurd on its face to claim that Title IX protects on the basis of gender identity. It does not. It is fundamentally incompatible with protecting on the basis of sex. I love this quote from the Supreme Court in United States versus Virginia. It says, while classifications based on sex are generally disfavored, as I think we would all agree, the Supreme Court has recognized that, quote, sex classifications may be used to compensate women for particular economic disabilities they've suffered, to promote equal employment opportunity, and to advance the full development of the talent and capacities of our nation's people. Well, even though Title IX might be clear in its face, that doesn't mean government bureaucrats are. And we've certainly seen some conflicting interpretations from various presidential administrations, such that state lawmakers within the last three years have really stepped up to the plate and started to pass women's sports laws that we affectionately dub Save Women's Sports Laws. You can see here, nearly half of U.S. states now has a law on the books protecting fair competition for female athletes. That's 22 states. North Carolina is currently working on a veto override, and I hope that uh, in the next few weeks they might make state number 23. Now just note, this, these laws apply to scholastic sports. They do not apply to professional. Now, the majority of these state laws are based on Alliance Defending Freedom's model legislation, which ensures three things. Number one, a clear definition of biological sex, in case we had any confusion about that point. Number two, clear protections for the female category, kindergarten through college. And number three, a private right of action, which is essentially legal speak for girls have the right to sue if their rights are violated. Based on our work in this area over the last four years, this type of policy is the most legally defensible. And you'll notice, you heard earlier today, it also is the most defensible in other categories as well, such as the science. Isn't that nice how that all is very symbiotic? But a sex-based female sports protection is unambiguous, it is easy to assess, and it's easy to administer. 
But perhaps most importantly, in the context of law, it is almost a perfect tie to advancing the government's interest in offering women and girls opportunities in sports. In other words, athletic ability is a sex-linked trait, as you've heard much about. And so categorizing based on sex is a legal proxy for categorizing based on athletic ability, which is critical for winning under an equal protection claim. But conversely, if you categorize based on gender identity, there's no athletic connection there whatsoever. So I frankly think that's frank, legally indefensible. It would be very difficult to win an equal protection challenge if a policy said we're going to categorize based on gender identity because it simply doesn't have that appropriate connection to athletic ability. Think about this. If we have two male athletes, one who wants to compete on the male's team identifies as male. He's forced to compete on the male's team, not allowed in the female category. We have another male athlete, similar comparable ability, wants to compete on the female team because he identifies as female. If you have a policy that allows that second male athlete to compete on the female team, you suddenly have disparate treatment between the two. They're similarly situated, they're both male, comparable athletic ability. That makes the policy suspect uh, under equal protection principles. Similar with testosterone suppression. If you've got a testosterone suppression policy, males with testosterone below a certain threshold are allowed on the female team. Well, what about the, the male athlete who has naturally occurring low testosterone? Those individuals do exist. Does that mean as a matter of policy, we're gonna start putting those individuals on the female team as well? I don't think so. But our sports policy uh, lawmakers don't seem to be thinking that through very well. Well. That's a very quick survey of some of the laws. Let's turn out of lawsuits. Just because you have a good law in the books does not mean those legal rights necessarily remain protected. They must be defended. Depending on how you count them, there are currently 12 lawsuits around the United States on the issue of women's sports. I like to think about them in four buckets. Uh, number one, lawsuits by female athletes against sports organizations or their school districts. Number two, lawsuits by male athletes who are challenging these new women's sports laws, demanding access to female teams. Number three, lawsuits by state governments, actually pushing back against government overreach, where administrations are trying to reinterpret Title IX to include gender identity. And then number four, lawsuits in the professional space. I know that is a lot of information. We're going to go pretty quickly, um, so I apologize for that in advance. Number one, lawsuits by female athletes. Of course, the first one filed in 2020. Uh, these are my incredibly brave female athlete clients. Selena Soul, Chelsea Mitchell, Alana Smith. I hope you're all familiar with them and their stories. Yes, absolutely. They deserve that. Think about the incredible courage that it took as 15 and 16 year old girls to be some of the very first in the nation to speak out on this issue and say this is not fair. And they took the incredibly difficult approach of actually suing their school athletic associate, their athletic association, their school districts, and the school districts of the male athletes as well. Of course, Connecticut's policy was some of the most radical, I think, in the country. Any policy that allows males into the women's category is wrong, but Connecticut's policy was a pure self-ID, nothing beyond that. And one male athlete actually competed in the men's category for three seasons, turned around two weeks later, and began to compete in and dominate in the female category. Oh, and by the way, he never made it to a state championship event in the men's category, but he certainly vaulted to success, we'll put it, put it mildly, in the female category. The district court in Connecticut, after we filed their lawsuit in 2020, sat on their case for 14 months and essentially waited for the male athletes to graduate, which, of course, in the natural course of things, they did. This, of course, was the same judge who directed us, their attorneys, not to use words like biological male because we needed to use more scientifically accurate terms like transgender female. So we actually, you can, I guess you can see what we were up against in that particular litigation before that particular judge. Nevertheless, the judge, after sitting on our case for 14 months, dismissed it and said, there's nothing here to see, nothing to do because the males have graduated, your clients have graduated. Well, of course, that's wrong. Our girls lost records. Chelsea Mitchell, the uh, athlete in the middle, she four times was the fastest female athlete in a state championship race. You all know what that means to a high school female athlete to make it to that point. Four times she walked away without the gold medal and without the public recognition because a male athlete crossed the finish line first. So these girls have records that need to be fixed. They need to be rightly acknowledged for their accomplishments. There's been a lot of, yes, exactly. 
happened a windy procedural history that I will not bore you with. I recognize it's after lunch. But just in June, the entire panel of the Second Circuit Court of Appeals decided to rehear their case. Basically, we're still at the starting line. Are we going to be able to make their full case under Title IX? Do they have the opportunity to be in court? And I'm delighted to say, thanks to the the support of so many of you in the room filing amicus briefs, talking about their cases online, the public support they received was just tremendous. And we walked out of court in June, really being thankful that we were us and we were not the other side. I think we are uh, optimistic that we will win this, but a win here means we return to the district court to fully litigate their case under Title IX. Just a couple quick notes on this. One, human stories matter. They impact policy making. These Connecticut athletes, when they first stepped out, utterly terrified, had no idea what type of movement we would see over the course of the next three years. And in fact, their stories really triggered, I probably shouldn't have used that word, uh, their stories really inspired the state lawmakers across the country in that first wave of passing women's sports laws. So you never know how your story and simply being public about it can impact, frankly, the course of history. Second, we should, and I think we will, see more and more of these female athlete filed lawsuits. I hope that as female athletes find their voice and are willing to hold those in power accountable, that we'll get to the point where the school administrators are more afraid of being sued by the entire team of female athletes than they are by one male who doesn't like the sex-based policy. We need to get to that point. The second category of lawsuits that we're seeing, this is really the primary area I'm litigating right now, it's the busiest, are lawsuits filed by male athletes against states that have um, passed women's sports laws. But I want you to recognize, keep in mind that 22 states have passed these laws, only seven so far have been challenged. The vast majority of them are fully in effect and are protecting female athletes today in scholastic sports. The first case that was filed was in Idaho in 2020. Uh, male athlete Lindsay Hecox, uh, who by all um, indications was, a, was very much a prop, but nevertheless filed a lawsuit demanding access to the Boise women's cross country team. Frankly, did not make the team even when given the opportunity to try out. My, uh, my clients, Madison and NK, you can see here on the left, are courageous cross country athletes. They had lost multiple times to June Eastwood, a name that may be familiar to many of you, named Big Sky Conference Championship Woman of the Week, and a really smoked woman in the, I think it was the Women's Mile at the 2020 NCAA Championships. Uh, unfortunately, at the district level, the court put the case on hold. And we appeal that to the Ninth Circuit, and frankly, given the makeup of our panel, we do expect a loss. So I think you all got to be prepared for that. We do expect to lose that particular one. Moving forward from Idaho, two of the lawsuits that are currently being litigated against states with women's sports laws are in Utah and Montana. Those are a little bit unique in that they're under state law, some peculiar questions of law in those cases. I don't think they're likely to be precedential for the rest of the US, so just wanted to flag that ahead of time. Indiana was also recently sued. It is the only case fully resolved, and it's, it's done. Thank you to the many of you who filed expert reports in that case. Um, I know that that made a difference. The law was put on hold at the district level. It was appealed to the Seventh Circuit, and there was a tremendous amount of support at the Seventh Circuit, only to then have the male athlete move out of the jurisdiction, and the case had to be dismissed. So that means it is resolved as a win, not a precedential win, but it's a win and we'll take it. Arizona. You heard yesterday from General Horn, superintendent of schools, about the fact that Arizona was most recently, uh, their state women's sports bill was challenged. Again, kudos to the many scientific experts in the room who have also filed statements in that case. I did learn yesterday that the court put the, put the law on hold. It did grant the preliminary injunction against us, which is disappointing, uh, but not necessarily, I, I suppose, a surprise. Um, to be frank, it was a poorly reasoned decision and the court used the wrong legal standard, which is something that we're finding to be fairly typical in a number of these cases. 
This is why I just want to underscore, when you file the lawsuit, you choose the jurisdiction. That is why it is so important for female athletes to be willing to sue, because when they're willing to sue, we get to choose the jurisdiction and we have a greater likelihood of success. When we're able to file in, in courts and in circuit courts that understand the right legal principles that, that are at play here. So just uh, FYI, that one is likely to be appealed to the Ninth Circuit. There are two cases, though, that I want to slow the film down on just a little bit. Florida is one. Florida was sued in 2021. Again, very typical story. Two male athletes in high school who wanted to compete on the girls' team. But this time, the court put the entire lawsuit on hold because there was another case pending at the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, which governs uh, Georgia, Alabama, sorry, my brain's tired, Florida, Alabama, Georgia. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was currently pending. So. That case was called Adams versus St. John's Board of Education. Adams involved a school board in Florida that created a policy, fairly uh, common sense policy, that was sex separated restrooms and locker rooms. It said, we have these sex specific spaces and if any student for any reason is uncomfortable using your sex specific space, you're welcome to use these single user facilities. But that wasn't good enough. And so a female who identified as male sued the school district demanding change. In December of this past year, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, sitting on banc, which means the entire um, appellate court, held that separating bathrooms based on biological sex passes constitutional muster and comports with Title IX. It was a resounding victory. It's full of solid legal analysis. It's a fantastic win for biological reality and just straight common sense. I must say it was good for my soul to read it. <laughs> You're like, yes, we actually have judges who understand the law and how it works. The plaintiff uh, who chose not to appeal to the Supreme Court, that means that this decision is final. It is on the books. It is the law of the land in those states, and we hope to use it as precedent that we can cite in other litigation as well. So that means taking it back to Florida, that case has now been reignited, and I do think ultimately the court will dismiss the case entirely because of Adams. There's no real basis to move forward. If restrooms are protected under Title IX, the analysis is far, far stronger in sports, and I think we win that one. Another case I wanted to slow the film down on just briefly is BPJ versus West Virginia. I've spent much of the last year and a half in this space. This again was a lawsuit by a middle school male athlete who wanted to be on the female team. Um, this beautiful young woman, Lady Armistead, is a soccer player in West Virginia, and she volunteered to intervene alongside the state attorney general to help defend the law. We were before a district judge that was not favorable so this judge initially put the law on hold, saying that our side was likely to lose, which is not really a very motivating way to start a case, right? It's a little bit discouraging. But we worked hard. We had excellent expert reports, including from Dr. Brown, um, who underwent significant depositions. Uh, we, we, did a, we produced a full record, over 3,000 pages in this record, and we won. We changed the judge's mind and persuaded him that it is both constitutional and it is consistent with Title IX to protect the female sex category. So that was a fantastic win. This was the first win in the United States on protecting women's sports. So that was really a, a phenomenal victory. It is currently on appeal, and we actually just learned yesterday that we expect oral arguments on that appeal to be in late October. So you can keep that in mind. Okay, number three, category number three, suits by government officials against executive overreach. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. You're gonna get more on this tomorrow. But obviously, the government has not been able to convince Congress to add gender identity to Title IX. So they're trying to do so via executive fiat. And they've tried to do that a couple of different ways. Number one, through a fact sheet that they issued and said, we're gonna interpret sex to include gender identity. That was challenged by Tennessee and 19 other state attorneys general. I hope that encourages you. In, in 20 states across the United States, they recognize that it is, it is wrong and it is a matter of executive overreach for the government to attempt to do this. So I think you ought to be encouraged that your state governments are fighting for you in this space. And they won. They won an injunction against the Department of Education's reinterpretation of Title IX. And so in 20 states, the Department of Education cannot use that fact sheet. Recently, Texas filed a similar lawsuit as well. 
But of course, the next legal horizon will be in October when the Biden administration has promised to release its new rules uh, reinterpreting Title IX. We've seen what the proposed rules look like. We ardently opposed them, vigorously opposed them. And I have very little reason to suspect that we'll see anything new in the rules when they are released in October. Uh, you should be aware that there are multiple state attorneys general who are ready to file lawsuits against the administration as soon as that happens. And Alliance Defending Freedom intends to as well. So if you have any current female athletes in public schools that are interested in being a part of landmark litigation, come talk to me. Um, no, no survey would be complete without a mention of professional sports as well. This is not a space in which I directly litigate, um, but of course, kudos to USA Powerlifting and others for their courage in um, trying to protect a, a separate female category. The legal issues and the analysis there is, is difficult. Um, we, there isn't a Title IX for professional female sports, and so I think there's a lot of work yet to be done, um, either in our interpretation of public accommodations laws or in passing new legislation legislation that actually does ensure that even these private organizations, um, that these professional sporting organizations rather, are required to ensure that female athletes have protection in their sports. But just in summary of the litigation, I know I covered a lot in a short amount of time. I just cannot underscore enough that as a lawyer, it is much, much preferable to be in an offensive position versus a defensive position. I'm playing defense in the vast majority of these cases, but we want to take the offensive position. We want to be the ones filing the lawsuits. We want to be the ones choosing the jurisdiction, choosing the claims that are to be brought. So I'll let that sit with you for a moment. The Supreme Court. This is, well, you can picture the Supreme Court. All right. <laughs> This is the million dollar question I always get asked, when is this issue going to reach the US Supreme Court? It is possible that it could be as early as this next term, which runs October to June. We have three cases right now that are currently at the Court of Appeals level. That is Connecticut, that is Idaho, and that is West Virginia. The thing is, the two cases that are furthest along in the pike, um, Connecticut and Idaho, I think are, are, tend to be a little bit more on procedural grounds. I think it is unlikely that those are going to go directly to the Supreme Court. I could be surprised. I think the best contender right now at the Court of Appeals is West Virginia. West Virginia has a decision on the merits. It has a fully developed record and Frankly, I like our chances, but we'll see. I think it is more likely that we will see a cert petition to the Supreme Court in the October 2024 term. But keep in mind, the Supreme Court does not always take the first case presented to it. Typically, the way the court operates is it allows an issue to percolate among the courts of appeals for a while, it sees a split, and then it decides to resolve that split. But I think there are a couple of reasons why I think the court might actually take the first cert petition on this issue. Um, number one, and many of you may remember back in 2017, the court accepted the first privacy case that was presented, the Grimm case. And we were everybody, I think, was really surprised that the court did that. So it, it just signals to me an interest in this issue. Number two, there was a motion that we filed with the US Supreme Court I won't bore you with the procedural uh, reasons and, and how we got around to that. But we filed a motion with the Supreme Court in the West Virginia case. And Justices Alito and Thomas wrote a dissent in essence, came back and said, this is an important issue and it is something the Supreme Court will need to resolve soon. So I think there is some appetite among the members of the court to hear this issue. My preference is to go up on sports over privacy, if we can make that happen. And I do think we have the votes to win. Of course, you never want to count your chickens before they're hatched, but I, I do like our chances at the Supreme Court. In conclusion, well, what do you know? In conclusion, just a couple of brief takeaways. Number one, I do think we win this. I do think we win this. We have strong cultural momentum right now. Uh, I, I'm sure many of you mentioned that Gallup poll, more than 70% of the American public agrees with us on sex-separated sports. Policies that protect the female category are the most legally defensible. And we're starting to see judges use the right legal analysis, which is what we need to win. But Friends in this room, we must have the appetite to fight this for the long haul. Legal wins do not happen overnight. Uh, again, we filed the first lawsuit on this issue in 2020. 
The first legal win in the women's sports arena was this year in 2023. It can take many, many years to get to the Supreme Court, many, many attempts. That's why we need more and more cases filed to give the court more and more opportunities to do the right thing. Number two, sports and stories impact public policy. Again, I can't underscore how just those three brave female athletes in Connecticut really spawned a legislative and in some sense a public movement here. The more women that speak out, the more sports organizations have the political cover to do the right thing. And the more judges, frankly, they read the newspapers, they read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, they keep a general pulse on what's going on. It makes it uh, easier and easier for them to reach the right decision. Finally, we've got to connect the dots for the culture. Failing to legally protect women based on their sex will have massive negative ramifications for women across so many areas of life, the, the full breadth of, with, uh, with, breadth of which I don't think we fully comprehend just yet. Certainly in the context of Title IX, we're talking about sports and scholarship and privacy, locker rooms, showers, dorm rooms, overnight accommodations. But they reach beyond that. Let's think about safety and privacy in domestic shelters, safe houses, prisons. We heard yesterday about the quality of medical care. We're litigating cases on behalf of doctors who want to treat male patients as male and female patients as female. That is up for contest these days, which is shocking. It impacts criminal statistics and news reporting, and the list just goes on and on. So this movement is about sports, but it is about so much more than sports as well, and that's why we've got to win it for the women. Overall, I'm optimistic because we do have truth and we have justice on our side. Thank you all so much.